Solomon was, King Solomon was rewarded by God because his heart was right. He, in his heart he desired to serve God and in his heart he desired to serve God's people. As such, because his heart was right before God, Solomon was rewarded by God and God made King Solomon the wisest ruler that has ever lived in history. There was nobody wiser and nobody who possessed more knowledge than Solomon. You see how God prioritizes the importance of knowledge and wisdom, especially when you're trying to fulfill God's destiny and call for your life? And then, number two, and number two goes along with God giving Solomon wisdom and knowledge, God made, gave Solomon the ability to generate and acquire wealth, and that, of course, is connected to wisdom and knowledge. And Solomon was not only the wisest, most knowledgeable man that ever lived, Solomon was the wealthiest king who ever lived. His wealth and his empire and his, what he owned, his assets, the assets of King Solomon dwarfed the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, etc., etc. So, knowledge is imperative. Why? You see, people who are in rebellion from God, people who are in the occult, people like Sir Francis Bacon, head of the Rosicrucian movement, which eventually became the Illuminati movement, he was one of the most powerful occultists in the world, Sir Francis Bacon. And, and his partner that mentored him, Sir John Dee. Sir Francis Bacon and Dee were, were the advisors to the Queen of England. Sir Francis Bacon was an intellectual, a scientist, and a deep practitioner of the occult. The problem is, his knowledge was not all in the area of godly knowledge because he sinned and dipped heavily into acquiring satanic, demonic, or uh, uh, carnal knowledge, which eventually was his undoing. So, but Sir Francis Bacon, to show you the power of his intellect, <clears throat> he was the inventor of the scientific method. Uh, empirical science, uh, scientific proof. He was an intellectual, he was an artist, he was an architect, he was an engineer, he was a chemist, he was a historian. We could go on and on. By the way, the pilgrims and the Puritans, if we're comparing them to Sir Francis Bacon, the pilgrims and Puritans were totally unlike today's Christians. Even as children, they knew Greek Hebrew, Latin. They were, they were uh, highly developed and advanced at the college level, the Pilgrims and Puritans. They were fully knowledgeable uh, about things like physics, um, economics, history, um, architecture, chemistry, biology, theology, uh, ancient super-civilizations, governmental structures, laws, philosophies, the, the history of the Greeks, the Romans, and, and, and many other cultures. The, if you would compare the children and the adults who were pilgrims and Puritans intellectually uh, with the intellectual level and educational knowledge level of Christians today, Christians today have been sadly so dumbed down by the educational system that they're operating at like a first, second, and third degree level. Whereas the Pilgrims and Puritans would be operating uh, uh, on a PhD level. It's because the Pilgrims and Puritans had such a robust knowledge of history, government, laws, philosophy, science, medicine, mathematics, uh, and so on and so forth, 
along with theology and the knowledge of the Bible and a thorough knowledge of history, that equipped and enabled the pilgrims and Puritans to begin constructing early America and they constructed it with such intellectual excellence and such knowledge that the pilgrims and Puritans created a firm foundation for the, the, the completion and vision of America was built upon the firm intellectual, scientific, biblical um, foundation uh, that was laid out by the Pilgrims of Puritans. So what I'm saying is America today with its both complex and completely unique and different legal system, governmental system, societal system, etc., etc. America is the only nation on planet Earth, the only nation on planet Earth that has such unique freedoms, liberties, and laws, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. No other nation has that but America. And only America, because of the Pilgrims and Puritans, knows that those certain inalienable rights come directly from God. They don't come from man passing it on to man. They don't do that. They don't do that. So, um, they, they were able to build America in a, in a phenomenal, phenomenal way. And they built it upon the, the knowledge, the historical knowledge, and the wisdom of the pilgrims and Puritans. Um, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, all of our freedoms, our method of government, our, the, the whole thing was all built uniquely by the pilgrims and Puritans. No other nation in the history of mankind has ever built a society like America. Israel was, was comparatively close, but America is completely unique. And it's because of the unique legal, governmental, economic structure, societal uh, uh, beliefs of America that, that all have its roots in biblical truth. It was for that reason alone, the roots in biblical truth, it was for that reason alone that God raised up America above all the nations on planet Earth which is exactly what God promised in Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and the curses, where you, half the chapter is divided into all these blessings that come upon God's people. Most of the blessings written are economic, um, that, that come upon God's people if they will do two things. First, they must worship only the true God and not worship idols. Secondly, they must um, um, hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, which means they need to read the Bible, study the Bible, and obey the Bible uh, diligently. If they do those two things, only worship God, not idols, and obey the Bible, study the Bible, and do it diligently, if they do this, just those two things, which are outlined in De Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 2, God promises to raise that nation up above all the nations on planet Earth.
And so as we look at the history of America, and by the way, it was Deuteronomy 28, that was part of the covenant that the pilgrims and Puritans entered into the biblical God with. They took it ser the pilgrims and Puritans took those promises from God seriously. Even though they were originally meant for the Jews, the pilgrims and Puritans <clears throat> secured those blessings by faith. So America, even though it wasn't perfect, but its heart was intending to obey all of those covenantal blessings. God raised America up above all the nations on planet Earth in just about every way, economically, militarily, on a societal level. America is without comparison, not because America is good or virtuous, because of the covenant of the Pilgrims and Puritans. So, uh, America became the most powerful economy in the world. America is the only nation on Earth that, even with all the trouble we have, it's the only nation on Earth that still has the largest population of middle-class people ever. No other nation in the history of planet Earth even remotely has the number of middle-class people that America has. That's the blessings from the Pilgrims and Puritans. Because you see, middle-class people have a relatively prosperous lifestyle. They, they have a large degree of freedoms. Up until recently, it was almost a guarantee that middle-class people could, could start from nothing and, and create their own business. Middle-class people and working-class people uh, both enjoyed these blessings. And middle-class and working-class people um, uh, had the ability to own their own home. When you look at history, the way all the other nations still work, because they didn't have the blessing of the Pilgrims and Puritans, every other nation on planet Earth up to this very minute has either practically no middle class whatsoever, or if they do have a middle class, it's a very itsy bitsy teeny middle class. People do not own their own homes, um, and uh, people are far, far poorer up until recently, and American middle class and working class are more prosperous, uh, they can own their own homes, and the whole concept of an American dream, that you could come here and work hard and own your own home and start your own business and have a life worth living, the whole American dream is birthed from the relationship that the Pilgrims and Puritans had with God and the covenant they entered into with God. No other nation on earth has uh, the equivalent of an American dream. Can you imagine them saying in China, come here to enjoy the China dream or the Chinese dream? That would be a sadistic and cruel joke. China is a totalitarian dictatorship. They don't own anything. I don't even know if they own their own toothbrushes. They don't own their own homes. Same with Russia, communist Russia. The same with every other nation on planet Earth that has embraced socialism, secularism, communism, and Marxism. They don't have an American dream. You would call their reality uh, a good synonym would be not the China dream, but the China nightmare. Not the Russian dream, but the Russian nightmare. Not the Cuban dream, but the Cuban nightmare. Not the North Korean dream, but the North Korean nightmare. Do you see where I'm going with this? Because none of those nations um, were raised up by God out of a covenant that the Pilgrims and Puritans establish. In my, my book that you can get at a discount, two books, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1 and 2. You need to get it. And you need to also get The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. 
and you absolutely need to go to paulmcguire.us and order yourself on a pre-sale discount uh, my brand new book that's coming out Power from on high. You, I'm telling you, you need to read these books, pass them around, and and prayerfully. You know, I'm not trying to disparage other Christian authors and stuff, but there's so much religious junk food out there that has the spiritual nutritional value of cocoa puffs and Fruit Loops and all these other sugar, hyper sugar garbage foods. They may give you a temporary rush, but you will die of disease. You will destroy your immune system eating that garbage. And, and that's what Christians do with the type of books and the type of content they read privately in their Bible studies or that they read in their home Bible studies or they study together as a church. Th their diet is the spiritual equivalent of Cocoa Puffs and Fruit Loops. Is it any wonder that the contemporary church in America has largely lost its power from on high and is spiritually anemic? No, there's a reason for it. Now here's the other thing that's critical. All these nations that I mentioned, and that would include France, which had the French Revolution, which occurred... I don't know, 15, 20 years after the American Revolution. The difference between the French Revolution, the French were very bright, intelligent, culturally sophisticated people, but the difference between the French Revolution in France and the American Revolution in America was simply this. The American Revolution was built and based on biblical values and a biblical worldview. That is why it succeeded on all levels. That is why it produced, until re relatively recently, an American dream and a free America and prosperity and protection for all. One reason. It was built on biblical principles and biblical ideas. In contrast, the French Revolution was built purely on the... the the secular humanist philosophies of fallen men and women. They told the French Revolution, they totally rejected the Bible. Totally. And instead of the Bible, they relied on the French philosophers to guide them. And and many, if not all, of the French philosophers like Voltaire, Rousseau, Rousseau and so many others. They were secretly financed by the Illuminati, which is a satanic, powerful, secret society. So the French Revolution is being financed by the occult forces of the Illuminati working through the French philosophers. And the French philosophers, even in the beginning of the French Revolution, have embraced the spirit of Antichrist, and they have a venomous hatred for the Bible, for Christianity, for Jesus Christ, for biblical morality. In fact, their hatred for Christianity and a biblical worldview is so intense that when I was writing my book that you also need to get, because it, it really links this whole truth together, uh, the book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, in that, along with the other books I mentioned, I, I dive deep into the French Revolution. And what I uncovered in my research was secret correspondence between a number of very famous, historically prominent French uh, philosophers who were ordering uh, the people under them that had power they gave them secret orders, the French philosophers, to just totally destroy and totally wipe out and totally kill the Christians and Christianity and the churches. In other words, obliterate them. Destroy the church, destroy Christians, destroy Christianity completely, including killing them. Wipe them out from France. 
And then the French philosopher in this instruction letter uh, telling his, uh, the people that are following his orders to wipe out Christians and Christianity, he closes his letter by saying, keep my message to you top secret. Let nobody discover or find out uh, what I really think about Christians and what I plan to do to the Christians or it could be a problem for us. You understand what that means. You understand what that means. So we shouldn't be surprised historically that when we look at the French Revolution we shouldn't be surprised that one, it was financed by the Illuminati. Two, that that the French philosophers had embraced an antichrist spirit to such a high level that the people were literally in revolt against the Bible, against Jesus, against Christian morality, and against the church. And they demonstrated their revolt by holding blatantly obscene, lewd, large sexual orgies in, in the sanctuaries of the churches. I mean, they were drinking, they were getting high, and they were having full-on, you know, sexual orgies as a way of defying and defiling uh, the church sanctuaries. Then, uh, under the, the demonic guidance of Illuminati agents and others, they erected all these uh, guillotines in Paris, and as I said the other day, I, when I was doing research for the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world, I, I spoke at a, a church of 25,000 people in Paris, France, and talked to them about some of the things I'm telling you about. And, and I did that one week after the Charlie Hebdo terrorist attacks, and I was struck by the fact that uh, even though built on humanism, the French rallied, the French people rallied in their time of crisis. And I posted it up in my website for you to see. You saw it in the news anyway. They would hold up these signs, no fear. And that should be the attitude for Christians in America regarding anything, regarding the economy, regarding chaos, regarding riots in the streets, regarding we should be holding up signs with no fear. And more importantly, when the Spirit of the Lord takes hold of us in the inner man or woman, our, our, the way we carry ourselves, think, and act should be based on the Spirit of God in which there is no fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. So I'm standing there by the guillotines in Paris, and I'm studying and analyzing and taking notes and videoing and, 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 and doing photographs. I'm with a French guy who's a Christian. And he, could, he, he told me a whole lot. <clears throat> but he couldn't tell me everything because, he, because, unlo because like most Americans and most Christians, he knew the secular history and he knew a little bit of the Christian interaction in history of the French Revolution. <clears throat> and he showed me key areas, etc., of which I'm thankful. <clears throat> but he had almost zero, like Christians in America, he had almost zero knowledge of the reality of the occult secret societies, like the Illuminati and the Rosicrucians, etc., that not only rose out of France, but were rising in Europe. So, and so he, he didn't have the ability to recognize blatant occult Illuminati and satanic symbolism all over the place, which leaves a, a huge clue as to what was really happening. So I'm standing there and I notice that <clears throat> there's a long walkway, really long. And on this walkway, which I'm walking and standing, beneath my feet going back, you know, to the French Revolution, this is exactly the same place that I'm standing on that the guillotines were in position. And of course you know with the guillotines during the French Revolution, they were chopping heads off just like crazy and the heads would roll, their bloody heads would, any enemy of the revolution, which included Christians, they were beheaded, their heads were chopped off, 
and their bloody heads were thrown in baskets, and I don't know what they did with them. So it was a massacre, and especially Christians were being massacred. They were being beheaded if they didn't go along with the French Revolution. So I'm standing there observing this and taking notes, and, and what I see at the end of the long corridor where there's the, the guillotines, I see a very prominent, very large sculpture of a giant pyramid with the all-seeing eye of Lucifer and the words from Latin, New World Order, on the base of it. So there, where the, the, the human sacrifice had taken place, there where the heads were beheaded and the blood rolled, fueled by the Illuminati, they left their signature. The occult pyramid, the all-seeing eye of Lucifer, which said New World Order on the base of it. But that was just one out of numerous hardcore, blatant occult symbols that I saw, which gave me a whole different perspective on the spiritual dynamic underneath the French Revolution. I saw, for example, they looked like giant Ferris wheels, okay? And they would be on, on street corners, very near this historic place, which was across, it was very close to that famous uh, French museum, which I just my, slips my mind right now, but you know what I'm talking about. And, and the palatial uh, castles and residences of the royalty of France. And I noticed that there were more uh, symbols, and that these giant, they look like Ferris wheels, which were, which were at the different corners of these major intersections in Paris. I didn't quite get it until after four or five days in Paris, but as I was, as he, my, my, the guy that was my guide, this French guy who, who loved the Lord, we were driving by, and it was early in the morning, and all of a sudden I understood what these Ferris wheel things were. Because when the sun hit them, so now I'm watching with the sun bathing these Ferris wheels, and they all light up with a golden hue, and all of a sudden, pow, I, I understand. I have kind of like a revelation of what the symbolic Ferris wheel things were on, on the street corners of the major streets as it's being hit by the sunlight. What they represented was the Sun King. In fact, one of the kings of France, he was called the Sun King. And if you study occultic history, which I have, you have to, because it's all what Mystery Babylon is about in ancient Babylon. In fact, what I'm telling you right now originated in ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel. This whole Sun King stuff. I'll explain what I mean. But it's in, in, in far more detail in my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. All of a sudden I have an epiphany and I see what these, these wheels of light are. What they are is they're symbolic representations of the sun god or the sun king. They're not just Ferris wheels. When they're hit with the sunlight, they, they reveal what the artist or architect intended. <laughs> they're symbols of the occultic sun in ancient Babylonian mystery religions. Because when you dive deep, which I have, and it's in my books, I mean, if you read my books in sequence, you'll see there's a truth. There are truths that gain momentum and power and if you want to have knowledge which will grant you power, you have to understand the nature of the matrix or reality that you live in and how you, by the Word of God, <clears throat> by godly knowledge, by renewing your mind with the Word of God, and a biblical worldview understanding of history, you can transcend the matrix that we live in because it's a control system. Okay, so... so what I realize what I'm looking at is a depiction of the sun god. And that, of course, is referenced by the name of 
uh, a French king who was referred to as the Sun King. And it's a historical fact that the Illuminati was very instrumental in France and Paris in both creating their enlightened, quote, enlightened society, humanistic society, and financing it. And so <clears throat> when, when you're looking as a researcher into what's a, a, a symbolic wheel that represents the Sun King, and you understand history, knowledge is power, then you understand that this is taking you back to ancient Babylon, the, the, the ancient mystery Babylon religions, and the central theme of mystery Babylon, which was birthed in ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel. The founder of ancient Babylon was Nimrod. According to his history, which means, you know, historical legend, historical beliefs, according to history, the, the founder or king of ancient Babylon and the builder of the Tower of Babel was Nimrod, who was thought to have been a Nephilim because he was a mighty man of God, genetically tall, and had a knowledge level that was way beyond the average person. So Nimrod uh, is on his way to Babylon and he stops at Forgive me for being, you know, a little bit vulgar, but he stops at a whorehouse. And in the whorehouse, according to ancient historians, he either fell in love with a beautiful prostitute or he fell in love with a beautiful madam and prostitute of the brothel or the house of prostitution. So he brings this beautiful woman, her name was Semiramis, back to Babylon with him. He can't tell the people of Babylon that <clears throat> he has just married a prostitute or a madam of a whorehouse. He can't tell them that. They would go berserk. So he lies. And Nimrod's cover story is that he married Semiramis, who was a goddess. Okay? So he told the people of Babylon that he married a goddess. And this begins what is called the goddess religions, or the mother goddess religions. Now, what happens, <clears throat> because of the character of Semiramis, <clears throat> she fights, she's unfaithful to Nimrod in many ways. Anyway, she murders her husband, Nimrod, and she realizes now she's in big trouble, if the people of Babylon find out. So she, too, conceives a lie to tell the people of Babylon that will explain the disappearance of Nimrod, who's no longer around. And she points up to the sky, she points up to the sun, and tells the people of Babylon, look at the sun. She says, Nimrod has ascended into the skies, and Nimrod has become Ra, R-A, the sun god. So this begins the foundation of the ancient occultic mystery Babylon religions. Semiramis is the female goddess, okay, the former prostitute, and Nimrod, who's dead, <coughs> is now Ra, the sun god. Okay, this is like, like a cosmic soap opera. Now, excuse me for being somewhat vulgar, but there's no way to tell the story without giving you some idea of what uh, Semiramis did, and it involves some vulgarity, so, you know, forgive me, but there's no way I can convey the historical reality without at least dipping into that, so here it goes. Okay, so... Semiramis was continuing to be unfaithful to Nimrod after he supposedly became Ra, the sun god. And so she has affairs and she becomes pregnant. Okay? Now, it's obvious to her advisors and to the people of Babylon, they're going to figure out real quick, due to the timing of Nimrod dying and becoming Ra, the sun god, and then the awkward timing that her belly's starting to get bigger because she's pregnant. It's like screaming, hey, I'm immoral, 
I was unfaithful to Ra the sun god. I was unfaithful to Nimrod. She probably wouldn't have lived very long. So she makes up another lie. And this time, she grabs a phallic object. Ancient occult super civilizations had phallic statues, phallic architecture, and phallic objects that they used both for sexual reasons and and more for like sexual worship occultic worship reasons okay now so she shows this phallic object to the people of Babylon and she says something to the effect holding the phallic object up she says something to the effect of um, uh, I was able to supernaturally, supernaturally become impregnated by uh, Nimrod through this phallic object. So what she's saying is, or what she's implying is, she wasn't cheating on Nimrod, the sun god, no, no hanky-panky, that she used the phallic object, and because it was supernaturally energized by occult power, she was able to supernaturally become pregnant. Okay, that's the story in a nutshell, but it's true. That becomes the basis or foundation of Mystery Babylon. So what comes next is uh, they build giant towers that are phallic symbols, are phallic-shaped towers that are huge. Okay, I don't need to spell out what phallic is. You can look it up if you don't know what it is. Okay, so, so they begin building these phallic towers. Now, one of the most prominent phallic towers, which began construction before she used the phallic object and before Ra, uh, uh, um, uh, Nimrod became Ra, the pyramidal Tower of Babel is considered by the ancient Babylonians and those who were practitioners of ancient occult religions, the, 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 the Tower of Babel was considered to be a ziggurat. Ziggurat is an architectural term for a pyramid structure. But it was both a pyramid structure and a phallic symbol structure. So, so it had a double meaning. It's an occultic pyramid, but it's also a phallic structure, okay? Okay, and the architectural term is ziggurat. Anything that's built in a pyramidical form is called a ziggurat. So, the Tower of Babel needs to be perceived uh, as conveying multiple me messages. It's, it's, it's an occultic pyramid-shaped uh, structure and it's a phallic structure. Now, when you look at the back of a US dollar, what do you see? You see an occultic pyramid with the all-seeing eye of Lucifer. But what you need to know is that occultic pyramid on the back of the dollar where it says New World Order on the base, that is a picture, a replica of the Tower of Babel or Babel there's a picture of the Tower of Babel on the back of your dollar. That's what it is. It's the Tower of Babel, and it is also an Egyptian pyramid. It has a double message if you know the secrets of Mystery Babylon. It's both a, a, a uh, pyramid-shaped building structure, and it's a phallic-shaped building structure. Now, that is part of Mystery Babylon. So the ancient, and so it's right on your dollar bill. On your dollar bill is a phallic symbol and an Egyptian pyramid, a cult symbol. And it's also uh, a representation on your dollar bill of the Tower of Babel. Remember, and I talk about this in my books, including A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1 and 2. Remember that... Um, the uh, mystery Babylon structures are occultic. So, 
And they are, that, that mystery Babylon mother goddess religion is being spread around the world. So the Egyptian empire, with, the, with what I call the pharaoh god king system, uh, starts to rise in, in ancient Egypt where the people are taught to worship the pharaoh and his family as god kings. But notice that the primary structure they use in their occult worship and to bury the pharaohs are the, the, the Egyptian empire builds these giant, impressive, mighty pyramids of Egypt. Now, remember that the Egyptians got the whole occultic idea of building giant pyramids from the giant pyramid known as the Tower of Babel. So the Egyptians were buying into this mystery Babylon religion. So when you see an Egyptian pyramid, what you're looking at is a Tower of Babel, a ziggurat. It's a pyramidical shaped structure, okay? And it's, this kind of thing spreads around the world. When you go to Washington, D.C., remember, America is founded by pilgrims and Puritans. The pilgrim and Puritan schools are so excellent that even uh, our founding fathers who were not Christian got educated in the pilgrim and Puritan schools and were exposed to a biblical worldview. But many of them, especially those that were secretly sent here on secret ships by Sir Francis Bacon, <clears throat> uh, were practicing occultists, Freemasons, uh, Illuminati, so on and so forth. So, the Washington Monument is a gigantic phallic symbol. That's exactly what it is. The Washington Monument is an occult symbol and replica of the Tower of Babel. But it is also a occultic phallic symbol. So when you see that famous view uh, through, through the windows in Washington C where, where the president often meets, you'll see uh, not only the Capitol Dome, now remember, the Capitol Dome is a womb-like structure. The Capitol Dome is an occultic womb-like structure, and the Capitol Dome represents the womb of Semiramis, okay? who also becomes a goddess. So when you're, when you're in Washington, D.C., you see the phallic Washington Monument, and if you look at the exact physical measurements of the Washington Monument, there's a lot of 666 numerology embedded into the construction. So you see the phallic monument, the Washington Monument, and it's lined up with the Capitol Dome which is the womb of Semiramis. This is all occult ritual being played out in the architecture of, our, uh, of Washington, D.C. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what a phallic symbol has to do, what a phallic symbol has to do with a womb-like structure. Cut to the chase. It's speaking of a d divine conception with the, the symbol of the phallic Washington Monument and the womb U.S. Capitol. When you are standing inside the U.S. Capitol and you're looking up at the dome roof, what you will see is all these paintings on the dome roof of the U.S. Capitol, the womb, paintings on the womb of Semiramis, and you'll see paintings of the gods and goddesses throughout occultic history, Neptune, Diana, Aphrodite, Venus, Osiris, Apollo, etc., etc. But you will also see President George Washington wearing the garbs of a Roman god. So Washington, D.C., uh, uh, George Washington is floating up there on the ceiling as if he's painted as if he was a god, not a man. And so they put him pictorially in a position to be worshipped 
as if he was God. As if he was God. You see, this right here in the architecture of Washington, D.C., you see the embedding and infiltration uh, and utilization and the harnessing of powerful Luciferian energies versus occult symbolism that goes all the way back to Mystery Babylon. You're listening to the Paul McGuire program, um, a prophetic emergency alert. This is how you understand what's going on now. We'll get to that more specifically in the next episode of a prophetic emergency alert. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Thank you.